Many people are asking what is up with the Grand Solar Minimum. Well, it's your lucky night. Because tonight we're going to do a full primer on Grand Solar Minimum. Now, it doesn't matter what scientists say. It doesn't matter how many subscribers you have. It doesn't matter what you feel. There is a definition of Grand Solar Minimum, and it's very specific. And after watching this podcast, you're going to be very informed on what that means and what the effects are. Now, we've been studying this topic for around a decade at length. And Grand Solar Minimum is not complicated. It's not rocket science. Grand Solar Minimum occurs when several solar cycles exhibit lesser than average activity for decades or centuries. They typically last 40 to 70 years, but some have last, lasted even longer. And those are really super grand minima. But we'll get to that by the end of the video. Now, solar cycles still occur during these grand solar minimum periods, but are at a lower intensity than usual. The grand minima form a special mode of solar dynamo operation, and that includes less sunspots and higher total solar irradiance. So there is a direct correlation between sunspot area and TSI, and sometimes when there are solar storms and the sunspot area is high, there is a negative correlation with TSI. So some unique things happening there, but there's a direct correlation between total solar irradiance and the amount of sunspots. So they're basically the same thing. And here you're looking at the sunspot numbers, the 11-year Schwab cycle or Schwab A cycle, and the 100-year Gleisberg cycle. Now the 100-year Gleisberg cycle is the grand minima cycle. Most of the low points on the Gleisberg cycle correspond to grand minima in recent times, at least since the Maunder minimum and since we've been plotting the Gleisberg cycle. So if you just look at this graph, you can see here in 2020 is approaching the bottom of the 100-year Gleisberg cycle, which would be a grand minima. Now here is the last 400 years of sunspot observations. So this graph is total solar irradiance where you can clearly see the Dalton minimum, the Centennial minimum, and the modern Eddy minimum, as well as the end of the Maunder minimum. And then we, here we see the sunspot numbers. And you can see the same Gleisberg cycles here, here, and here. Same three Gleisberg cycles. And you can see the Maunder minimum, the Dalton minimum, the Centennial minimum, which was a pretty weak, uh, high minimum, not a very weak minimum, the modern maximum, and now the modern minimum, which some are calling the Eddy minimum. Now let me just bring your attention to cycle 24, which has already occurred, and we're now rising up in cycle 25. Many people think cycle 25 is going to be the biggest cycle in history, but there's no evidence that suggests that. It's in fact almost twice as weak as any of the last five cycles. Eight cycles to be exact. And cycle 24 was weaker than the weakest cycle in the centennial minimum. So cycle 24 is already weaker than any of the three, four cycles, five cycles in the centennial minimum. Which means we're in another grand minimum. Period. It's not even an argument because the definition of grand minimum is a weak group of solar cycles. And so far we have 24 and 25, which are weaker than the entire centennial minimum. So now we're in the modern minimum. Now, some of the most famous grand solar minimums are the Munder minimum, also known as the prolonged sunspot minimum. Because you can see here in this graph, from 1600 to 1700, there was almost no sunspots. Although you see these red 
dips, peaks. I think it's just that we're missing data. So the sunspot free time was from about 1650 to 1700. That's 50 years of no sunspots. That's a long time. And so the Maunder minimum was one of the deepest minimums in recent memory. But the minimum before the Maunder, the Sporer, was even deeper. And so there is a waning and waxing of grand minima. Up and down. And the Centennial was the weakest of the grand minima in recent memory. And we're going to show you a longer term chart in just a minute. Okay, so let's get back to the Maunder minimum, which was a prolonged sunspot minimum. It was a period around 1645 to 1750 during which sunspots became exceedingly rare. In fact, during a 28-year period of 1672 to 1699, within the minimum, observations revealed fewer than 50 sunspots. That's total. This contrasts with the typical 40,000 to 50,000 sunspots seen in modern times over the similar time span. Now, the Maunder Minimum was first noted by Gustav Sporer in publications in 1887 and 1889, work that was relayed by the Royal Astronomical Society in London and then expanded on by solar astronomers Edward Walter Munder, 1851 to 1928, and his wife, Annie Russell Munder. And they are literally legends in the sunspot Hall of Fame. So that's the Maunder minimum. Then we have the Dalton minimum, which was a period of low sunspot count, just like cycle 24 and 25, representing low solar activity, just like cycle 24 and 25. And it was named after the English meteorologist John Dalton. And it lasted from 1790 to 1830, which is a clean 40 years, four solar cycles. And there's a couple of arguable dates. It could also be 1796 to 1820, which is actually the most minimum part of the Dalton minimum. So either way you look at it, it's arbitrary. But it includes very low activity cycles relative to the rest, just like 24 and 25. Are you picking it up? Now, a paper coming out in 2018 Solar activity over nine millennia, a consistent multi-proxy reconstruction. We're going to provide you with the entire paper for free because that's how we do. And it has some amazing charts and graphs that we were able to capture from the paper and make our own. And here are some of those graphics. This is the reconstruction of the modulation potential going back 7,000 years, which would be the total solar irradiance or sunspot number showing over a hundred grand solar minimum and maximum in 7,000 years. Now what we've done is taken that data and put it in one single graph and we've added the modern minimum, the centennial minimum, the Dalton minimum, the Maunder minimum, and the Sporer minimum for reference. And you can see the Sporer minimum was longer and just as deep as the Maunder, which was shorter. So the Sporer minimum was very geo-effective. And in fact, ended many empires, as well as the Maunder minimum. The centennial minimum was a little weaker than most minimums, and the modern minimum is just beginning. But these grand minimas and maximums happen every approximately 100 years on the Gleisberg cycle. Sometimes they last for two cycles, and they're larger, like the Sporer. And I think that the modern minimum may be one of those that will last four or five solar cycles. So we're just in the second solar cycle of a four or five solar cycle grand minima called the modern eddy minimum, where the question mark is. And it's not a question if it's a grand minima at all because cycle 24 is already lower than any of the cycles in the centennial minimum. So those are the facts that we know about what grand solar minimums are and how we determine them. Well, they happen every 100 years, so the next one started now <laughs> and will last for a few decades or centuries, as the others have. And what happens during these times? We have global unrest. We have periods of famine. We have extreme drought, as well as extreme deluge. Huge temperature swings. 
And every now and again, we have the end of an empire, like the end of the Roman Empire, the Minoan Empire, and soon the modern empire. Because during these times, we have increased volcanic activity. And with the huge population on Earth, a large volcanic eruption would be certain doom. We have large earthquakes that occur, like the earthquakes that occurred in the Dalton Minimum on the New Madrid, ones that shifted the direction of the Mississippi River and crushed the population in the United States at the time. If that were happened today, well, it would take decades to recover. And then there's the possibility of a major solar flare, cosmic rays. And we know they nucleate clouds and cause the flooding we've seen just getting started. So grand solar minimums are no joke. They cause climate havoc. And they really affect the bottom line of financial markets worldwide. This is not speculation. These are facts. And we're sticking to them. And that's a boom. To knowledge. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. In a dystopian world where we had to walk it through, through it. We had to walk you through it for you. I hope you got something out of the video. If you have any questions, leave them below. And we'll be regularly updating this topical video, the Grand Solar Minimum Primer, almost annually. It's been a few years since we up, updated this, and I hope it refreshed your memory. Be safe. We love you. And that's a boo. To knowledge. Mm -hmm.